Good morning and welcome to Skyway special presentation. My name is Ken Reed. I'm uh, with Skyway. I'm a senior Vertiport planner and integrator for Skyway Technologies. Uh, if you're not familiar with Skyway, Skyway is creating the low altitude traffic management system uh, that will be used to navigate over the skies of our communities for drones and urban air mobility vehicles, first responders, et cetera. Um, my experience is primarily as an airport planner with a specialty in computer simulations of vertiports and airports, uh, but I'm also a pilot and I was a flight instructor in college. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about something that's very different. And in my opinion, uh, quite amazing. Last year, I had the pleasure to meet with uh, Dr. Gacheng Zha, a professor from the University of Miami. Miami, sorry. <clears throat> I can tell uh, I can tell when someone is smarter than me and more accomplished me, with me than me when they have more uh, acronyms in their resume than I do, and that's certainly the case here. Uh, you've worked with DARPA and NASA and others, uh, Professor. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. How about yourself? I'm good. It's very cold here, though, in Colorado. All right. Now that we've covered the basic facts that we're both very smart, let's get to the heart of the matter. Uh, you've either reinvented or a minimum drastically improved wings. Um, your new technology doesn't just increase the lift generated by a wing, but it also reduces the drag. Now, when I was in flight school, I remember this is something that I was told was impossible, that anytime you increase lift, you increase drag, uh, but you've somehow changed the rules. And, and so we're going to get kind of technical today, but because not everybody's uh, up to speed, perhaps, with uh, some of these concepts, uh, we're going to go back to the basics just briefly, and then we'll get into the, the technical details. First, how do wings work? So we all know this, wings are shaped in a way that causes the air to flow over the top faster than they flow on the bottom. That increased speed causes a decrease in pressure. Uh, and then that pressure difference causes the wing to lift up in the air. Now, these principles go back hundreds of years. It's not just since the Wright brothers. Is that right? Um, yeah, I think the uh, first uh, discovery was by... Uh, Sir George Cayley in England in 1850s. So he wow. mimicked the uh, dolphin's shape to get, uh, understand the uh, mechanism of airfoil. So just to introduce a couple other things, we've got thrust for the, the pulls of the wing uh, and drag. We've already talked about this. And, and when you double the speed, you quadruple the lift and drag uh, for a wing. Um, so were you looking to make a more efficient wing when you started your research? The original intent was to uh, apply cocktail jet to aircraft engine compressor. Uh, we were trying to decrease the stage of the uh, compressor. So we come up this uh, concept. So we were able to reduce six stage of compressor to two stages by increasing the uh, pressure, adverse pressure gradient we can go. Um, but the compressor blade is actually also airfoil. Um, so that's the same as the aircraft used in any other machineries using, most many machineries using airfoil. Uh, but the problem is that- You mentioned adverse pressure gradient. I'm sorry? Let's talk, you mentioned adverse pressure gradient. Let's talk about that because we talk about how wings work. This is how they fail. They stall, right? So a stall is caused when the airflow no longer flows over the wing. And uh, it's caused by this adverse pressure gradient. And by increasing that uh, adverse pressure gradient, we increase the system performance or the, the efficiency of the wing. So, and, and how do we do that? We do that with, uh, uh, how do we achieve the high pressure gradient limit? Uh, with high efficiency and low energy expenditure, and that's through the CoFlow jet. So, so let's get into how that actually works. So, you have put uh, uh, electric again. These are electric micro compressors embedded into the wing, and you're pulling air from the tail end of the wing, and you're pushing it back over the top of the wing, uh, and you're overcoming this 
pressure gradient uh, with no flow separation. So basically you've, you've made a wing that doesn't stall or it stalls at a very high angle of attack. Is that a good description? Yes, that's, that's good description. Okay, we're gonna show a quick video here. Remember, turn off your microphone so we don't get an echo here. Uh, and everyone should hear this as it plays. We're gonna go there and go to the YouTube video and hit play. The CoFlow Jet system embeds a series of compressors along the length of the wing. It sucks a small amount of air near the back of the wing, then blows that air out near the front of the wing to increase lift and reduce drag. This animation shows a compressor that our lab designed, built, and tested. Here are the internal features of the CoFlowJet system as we set it up to be tested in a wind tunnel. This animation shows the CoFlowJet effect. The blue line on the bottom right plot indicates where we turn on the CoFlowJet. You can see from the black and white video that before we turn it on, the air flows past the wing but once the jet starts blowing, the air quickly sticks to the top of the wing. This effect triples our lift and more than halves our drag for this experiment. Once we reach the red line, we turn the CoFlow jet off and the flow returns to the state it saw before the CoFlow jet was turned on. These graphs show the lift and drag measured via wind tunnel testing. The yellow dots indicate the results of a wing without the CoFlow jet. As you can see from the left graph, the lift of the CoFlow jet far exceeds that of a conventional wing. The right shows that the drag is far less than a conventional wing's. Not only is it less, but the drag is actually negative, meaning that the CoFlow jet is producing thrust, helping to propel the... Okay, that's amazing. Again, this doesn't seem right. You've created more lift uh, and not only did you not create more drag because of that lift, you've decreased the amount of drag. So let's look at what that means in aviation and what can, what can occur. <clears throat> For example, here's an example where you've put the CoFlow jet technology into the flap of a wing and you could retract that flap during flight, although you don't need to because it still increases the performance of the wing. But because this wing doesn't stall, you can create a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft using this deflected, deflected slipstream. And you don't have to have tilt rotors or tilt wings. Is that correct? That's correct. And not only can you create either a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, in which case you still have to use a lot of power on the engines that are mounted on the front of the wing, uh, but you could use a lower flap deflection, shorten the runway length, and create a short takeoff and landing aircraft, right? Yes, that saves a lot of energy by using runway to take off and landing. So not only have you made a better wing, you've made a better aircraft, because you don't need as much runway. Yeah. Right? Okay. That's fascinating. So, uh, did my slide advance? Here we go. So, we're going to go through some of the different uh, industries that this technology can be used in. And starting with aerospace, we just talked about this. No tilt rotors. Uh, no tilt wings. So you just changed, although it's, it's too late to put these in the first generation of these aircraft, uh, but Joby, Archer, Lilium, Vertical, all of these could benefit from this type of wing, right? Yes. And that's not all because there's, uh, you're so efficient, uh, we can alter uh, whisk uh, as well and beta shown on the right. Uh, so you don't have to use tilt rotors. Now, uh, tell me a little bit, what do you save on these aircraft? Well, this aircraft in general are all based on rotorcraft technology. So, you know, they are basically from zero to one. In other words, we didn't have electric vert vertical takeoff aircraft before. So they, 
did a great job to deliver this kind of um, first generation eVTO to the market. And it is absolutely a great work. But technology is still basically existing technology, uh, which could be, you know, it's not necessarily the most efficient way. Um, all these aircraft, one common feature is that when they do hover, takeoff and the landing, they need to tilt up the um, propeller facing upward. <clears throat> For example, the lift plus one like whisk and um, beta, they have dedicated propeller just uh, for hover and the takeoff. And then after that, after taking off, they have to align the uh, propeller to reduce drag. But overall, it's HA still create a lot of drag. They don't need to use this uh, propeller in the mission, but they have to carry it. Not just increase drag, they increase a lot of weight. And then for the tilt rotor or tilt wing, the mechanism itself is quite complicated. You, you can imagine you have to tilt up quite heavy uh, rotors and also the wings. So overall, the, the weight is in general quite high, so that can affect their um, efficiency a lot. Certainly, then the other important things is that <clears throat> all this kind of mechanism is like helicopter. Um, they have the, the propeller has induced the downwash, that's the flow interacting with the wings and overall aircraft structure that could a lot, create a lot of vertical weight, uh, noise. So we generally we call it broadband noise. Uh, yeah, we, we know that Joby is actually doing, doing a very good job, um, have a low noise. Um, in particular, you know, they measure, compare at the cruise at a certain altitude with the other aircraft. But it's still very, it's still challenging at hover takeoff in the landing phase. Um, you know, we, it will be always desirable to be very quiet or to be silent. Um, for the co flow jet, we avoid this downwash interacting with the wings because the flow is well attached with the flap. So that could bring a lot of advantage there. So, in other words, the, uh, using the co flow jet deflect slipstream, we don't just be able to provide higher efficiency, we are also able to uh, deliver much quieter aircraft. So the beauty of these aircraft, first, they're all electric, so they're environmentally friendly. But secondly, they're, they're and by their definition, they're vertical takeoff and landing. And to do that, in some cases, they've introduced uh, the mechanical uh, ability to rotate the engine, or they've introduced vertically mounted uh, blades that turn off when the aircraft is in route. It's not needed during flight, but it must introduce a lot of drag and, uh, and take up a lot of energy. Uh, so you've, you've not only allowed them to still take off vertically, still be environmentally friendly, but you've saved them weight, uh, made them more efficient when they are in route, uh, if you put the CoFlow technology in the wing. So you've just taken this brand new uh, area of aviation and improved it even more than it was before, right? Yes, that is uh, our goal and that is our interest. <clears throat> but it's not just vertical takeoff and landing and short takeoff and landing aircraft. This technology could be put into existing aircraft. And this is my favorite example. You worked with DARPA on this one. Tell me a little bit, what was it like to work with DARPA? Um, what do you the Working with the DAPA is certainly um, very exciting, and they are much more visionary and uh, audacious. <laughs> they are willing to give money to try something <laughs> radical, um, which does not <laughs> in exist before, and high risk, high payoff. And we, we were very lucky we get about a million dollars from DAPA. So the, uh, at that time, there was a uh, application background is to make the... Um, military transport uh, be able to take off the landing using very short runway. In, in the battlefield, you may not have the luxury to have a nice long airport. So to do that, then you need to have very high lift coefficient. And the DAPA was you know, interested in this technology to have a high lift coefficient. 
So we kind of like conceptually redesign the C130 and by putting co-flow jet there. And so we are not able to just reduce the takeoff and landing distance. We are able to increase cruise speed and overall cruise efficiency. And as a result, we have longer range. I, I highlighted the range on this slide. It's amazing. You've gone up almost 50%. You've increased the speed of the aircraft, all while keeping the payload exactly the same and the weight of the aircraft the same. And, and you've cut the takeoff length almost in half from almost 4,000 feet down to 2,000 feet. Um, that's amazing. Uh, but not only did you alter or affect or impact the design of the, the wing for lift, uh, you've also put CoFlow jets into uh, a flapped rudder, which can deflect 70 degrees. Now, 70 degrees would be unheard of on a regular aircraft, wouldn't it? Yeah, that is very true. Just by looking at these slides, you can see on the left, it is the uh, regular uh, <clears throat> vertical tail. The uh, angle in typical would be deflect 30 degree as is shown there, but you can see that there's a separation from root to tip. And because the flow cannot sustain such a deflection angle of the, uh, the flap. And on the first row, on the right one is the co-flow jet uh, vertical tail. We put a micro compressor inside the flap. It's also deflected 30 degree. You can see the flow is very nicely attached. And we have a root vortex and also tip vortex that is natural because in the root there's a gap so that the flap can can uh, deflect so you can see that there's no flow separation flows very nicely attached and because of that the lift coefficient is increased uh substantially from the baseline is 0 0.75 this one's 1 1.32 it's almost like uh, nearly doubled and then you can see also the drag is a lot reduced. The baseline on the left is 0 0.108 and the coflage is 0 0.076. Of course, um, <clears throat> we should include the um, power consumption of the coflage, but in, by including that, we still gain a lot of aerodynamic efficiency. Um, the same thing as this um, slides show, we can go even higher deflection angle with the flow very well attached. For example, when we turn deflect at 70 degree, they lift the coefficient about three times higher than the baseline. So what all that this means? It means we can reduce the control surface of large aircraft such as Boeing 737, 787, at least by half. When you reduce the size by half, you reduce the drag, you also reduce the weight. So there's a lot of benefit because of this. And we did a um, a conceptual study applying this to Boeing 787, we would be able to reduce the uh, fuel consumption by about 13%. So that's obviously, um, we think it's a quite effective way uh, to, to save fuel consumption and the you know, emission pollution. So it's environmentally friendly. Uh, I imagine if you put this in a fighter jet's tail, you could make sharper turns uh, you're not going to stall, so you're, you're, you've increased the, the performance of a fighter jet as well as the efficiency of a cargo jet. Uh, all impressive. Uh, now, this isn't just theoretical, right? You've also put this into wind tunnel testing. Uh, and um, did you get the results you were hoping for when you did the wind tunnel testing? Yes, we did. Actually, not just what we're hoping for, it was actually uh, better than our expectation. When we did the first experiment um, funded by NASA, we were surprised to see the drags negative. Um, at that time, we still need to understand why it is negative drag. <laughs> and then we, after we analyze, um, and then it make perfect sense. Uh, it is, it does not <laughs> violate the physics law because when we enhance the jet velocity, um, we feel the wake. So basically, 
the wake, instead of have a regular velocity deficit, we get a reversed velocity deficit. So the wake velocity is higher than the ambient velocity. So that will generate thrust. The other thing to see this uh, mechanism is that when we have the jet injection like this one, for example, the, 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 the uh, cursor uh, here, it induces low pressure at the leading edge. When the pressure at the leading edge is low, you reduce the pressure drag. You basically generate lift, resulting the force moving forward as a thrust. So if, if I understand that correctly, it sounds like the results were so good, you thought that you violated the laws of physics. And you had oh, to prove multiple that you times didn't. we feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to go back to study, make sure we didn't. <laughs> All right. I have a question. I have you and I have talked about this a number of times, but I have a question I've never asked you before. You're you're sucking the air off the tail of the of the wing and you're blowing it over the top or the front of the wing. Which of those two is more important, or are they both required? If I if I were to block the air being blown over the top, have I lost the entire effect? Or I or the back? If I block the air going into the back, have I lost the effect? Is it the two combined that makes the, the wing work? Yes. Actually, the two, each one has effect. Um, injection and suction, both are very important. But effectiveness point of view, I would just say injection probably more effective, but combined. It's much more than any individual one. But the other, actually, you ask a very good question. The other very, very important feature of combining injection suction together is that we are able to create zero net mass flux flow control. So it is self-contained. We don't need to introduce the air from anywhere else. There are other flow control technology. They only have injection only or suction only. Then in the two-dimensional control volume, uh, in a point of view, the mass is not conserved. In other words, when you want to do injection only, where's the air will be from? Or when you do suction only, where the, you are going to dump the air? And so all those things will create a lot of extra loss and extra energy required. A co-flow jet is very nicely integrate together in the best position for injection and the suction. Um, yeah, we, we feel very um, pleased about this configuration. I assume you want to do more uh, testing. Are you ready to build a prototype? We are ready. And <laughs> we're just looking, welcome money <laughs> to, to, to do these things together. Uh, we are very ready. Yeah. Perfect. So, I mentioned early on that it's cold here in Colorado this morning. I learned to fly in cold weather. Icing has been an issue uh, all through my aviation career. But one of the benefits of your technology is you can de-ice the entire wing by simply blowing air through the wing, which uh, is amazing to me. You don't have uh, fuel in the wing like we would in, in any other aircraft, so there's no risk of of the wing blowing up and you can, it looks like it's a pretty open wing. So I assume the air flows through that. So my question is, is the de-icing system a natural byproduct of the compressors simply running in the wing or is it an option? Is it something you turn on and off as needed? Yes, it is a byproduct is also an option. Yes. Yeah. When you need to do the icing, you can see the, uh, the graph you put there in the, in the middle graph, you can see number 14, it's going to be a heat element. It will heat that part of the airfoil. And then you can also see the airflow will go around that. Typically, most of the ice accretion will be at the leading edge. So this one, we can heat up the leading edge. Actually, in a very low temperature, we don't. the air temperature does not need to be high. So because we have air everywhere along the span, it provides this capability. This seems sounds natural, that's why we say it's a natural byproduct, but such kind of air is not available for small aircraft or in general, propeller aircraft. Large aircraft like Boeing 737 or 787, they introduce hot air from jet engine for de-icing. 
But small aircraft, you don't have it. Of course, you don't have to fly, right? Certainly, that, but that will limit your usage of the aircraft. Um, yes, that, this is a, actually, we feel a very important advantage so that we can fly all weather in everywhere in the world, hot place or cold place. This is, a, this is amazing. Uh, so not only have you increased the efficiency of the aircraft, uh, it generates very little noise. You don't have the tilt rotors, the tilt wings. Uh, you've decreased the weight, uh, which also increases the efficiency. It's not a very complex system. Looks very comfortable. Uh, the de-icing system, uh, and, and it can be used for both uh, vertical takeoff and landing and short takeoff and landing. And, and you can convert existing aircraft. I, I'm not sure everybody listening grasps just how important all of this is. You've made a, a better wing, a lighter aircraft, more environmentally friendly. It can fly in more adverse weather. Uh, it can turn sharper and land on shorter runways. All of these are very impressive. Uh, but that's not the only industry that you have affected here. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, the energy and the, the weight savings when you look at wind turbine technology. Thank you. That's a very good um, you know, <clears throat> application. We, we actually understand that the principle of wind turbine is actually about the same as aircraft wing. Of course, the wind turbine is spinning. And from energy transfer point of view, wind and wind turbine is absorbing energy from the flow and convert to electricity. Um, because of the co flow just high lift, high efficiency, and applying to wind turbine is actually uh, can be visioned even without trying it. But since about four years ago, we did a serious study and put the co-flow jet there, we validated with the experiment and we are able to improve the wind turbine uh, power output substantially. And the photo shown here is a two-blade turbine and we compare with a three-blade turbine, same size, same uh, platform of the blade, we are able to increase the uh, power capacity, capacity factor by at least 20 percent. So that basically any power output could be more by 20 percent. And this brings a lot of advantage because when you reduce one blade, you reduce a lot of weight. And the, those blades are very big, huge. Um, you know, the G recent uh, <laughs> turbine blade, one blade is 110 meters, uh, very heavy. So they bring many advantages by reducing one blade. And Yes, this is an application uh, which could be, um, you know, has very high potential. So once again, you are messing with the laws of physics. You have gone from three blades to two blades, which should result in less energy, but you've increased the energy by putting in the co-flow jet technology into the blade, right? Yes. In other words, we leverage the co-flow jelly. So we just put a small amount of the energy, but we bring a lot more energy back from the wing. That's what I was going to ask next. Yes. You're putting energy into this wing, but you're getting more than that energy out, right? Yes. Uh, that's amazing. And not you're not just done there. This one, This one really gets me you've affected ships as well. This technology for propelling ships uh, by rotating disc, extended discs or tubes that, that come off the top of the aircraft, uh, not the aircraft, the ship, is itself confusing to me. It doesn't look like a wing, therefore it shouldn't be a wing. It doesn't look like a sail, it shouldn't work. Uh, but not only does it work, you've made it better, didn't you? Yes, actually, this is a very uh, exciting uh, recent application we are working on. Actually, from aerodynamic textbook, we understand a regular cylinder, stationary cylinder, will not generate lift because the geometry is symmetric. But if you spin the cylinder, it will generate lift. 
we call people call the Magnus uh, effect. It was first discovered by Pronto nearly a hundred years ago. And then people applied the spinning cylinder to the ship to generate lift to propel the ship. But you can imagine rotating cylinder is not a trivial thing. In particular, when the cylinder is very big, you need a motor, you need a you know bearing, it could in the maintenance, all those things could be, you know, complicated. So by so using co-flow jet cylinder, we don't need to spin the cylinder. And we're just using co-flow jet on one on the uh, leeward side of the cylinder, it will generate very high lift much higher than the spinning cylinder with much, much lower uh, energy cost. So then you may ask why you use a cylinder instead of the airfoil uh, for the ship. Um, actually, that's a very good question. There are people using airfoil or like aircraft wing, but from lift coefficient point of view, cylinder is actually has higher lift coefficient than airfoil. So why don't we use a cylinder for aircraft then? But cylinder has issues of drag is high. And using cylinder <coughs> with a very high lift coefficient for ship is excellent application because the drag would be a lot of time would be just in the direction normal to the ship mo motion direction. So the drag will not do work. But for aircraft, drag will do work is opposite your flight direction. So this is actually indeed a very interesting application. It's also just a new market just starting because fuel price is very high and everyone cares about environment emission reduction. So there's a lot of interest now trying to harvest wind power from the ocean to propel these cargo ships. So yes, that is um, something uh, Coverage can contribute. But just following all these uh, applications, Actually, co-flow jet is a fundamental technology. As we, you mentioned at the beginning, it overcome adverse pressure gradient. So we put the three applications here. Actually, the application is much broader than this. On the aviation side, we are the the eVTOL is just an entry point. And you already mentioned a few examples. We look for you know transforming the basically overall aviation industry. And for transonic and high supersonic, we can improve a lot of low speed performance and the control surface. Uh, wind turbine, the same thing. We hope to harvest much more power and the same thing for ship. Overall, we wish to bring a lot of impact to these industries. And these aren't small dollar amounts that we're talking about. Uh, these are trillion dollar industries uh, by 2040. Uh, and the ships, the fuel consumption reduction from 20% to 50%. So you're not making the ship all electric. The, uh, the ship still has to use some fuel. Are the CoFlow jet compressors electric on the ships too? Yes. Actually, we generally call them fan is because the pressure ratio is very low. For example, uh, pressure ratio, we are talking about only just 1.01 or 1.02. In other words, we just need to increase the pressure by a couple of percent. So the fans would be in the same category of the building's HVAC fans. Um, yes, they would be powered by electric. And the ship still need uh, their regular engine because sometimes you may not have wing, <laughs> or sometimes you may be complete against the wing, but Overall, in the mission, in particular, is annual uh, usage. You are going to we expect to reduce a lot of fuel reduction, and this fuel reduction is in a very large amount. So and I love just and I, give <laughs> one more example. I love that, yeah, you. I love that you've got your EV toll aircraft in all three of these examples as well. <laughs> so I can fly out to the ship, or I can fly out to the wind turbine. <laughs> Uh, although I'm not getting out of that one on the wind turbine, uh, I think I would blow off that platform. Uh, no, the uh, so that, that time, <laughs> the, the blade is not moving. Okay, <laughs> With the blade <laughs> stopped for maintenance. That's why the aircraft's flying there. But, but the blades, the blades don't move very fast, right? Are they still? I mean, are has the blade speed increased? 
Uh, no, the blade speed is not fast. Like uh, the long blade we are talking about, usually RPM is about 10 or even less. Really depends on your blade length. Um, but Still, if you have three have... blades, there will be always one blade that will be vertically up. It's difficult for helicopter or, or vertical takeoff landing up to land. Even the blade is not moving because you have the risk to hit the blade. But when you have two blades, it is completely horizontal beneath the platform. You can safely land there. We don't ask you to land when the blade is spinning, but at least when the blade is not moving, it is safe. <laughs> so I could have a picnic out there on that platform. <laughs> well, that would be a great view to have a picnic. <laughs> it, it would be. Or drop a line, do a little fishing, catch a couple sharks or something. You know. Oh, absolutely. I think there must be good fish in the deep ocean, right? <laughs> so this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, we mentioned already you'd probably like to do some more computer modeling. Uh, and uh, are you ready to build an entire aircraft prototype? We are ready. Um, the only thing we need is uh, funding. And we are looking actively looking for investment. Uh, definitely welcome whoever interests, you know, joining us. Well, that's, that, and that brings us right to our, our next and last slide uh, uh, for questions and answers. You are welcoming collaboration. So if anybody is uh, interested or as fascinated by this topic as I am, because I truly think that this is revolutionary. I can't think of any technology in my lifetime that has changed aviation so much uh, and, and made it more efficient, increase the range while uh, minimizing environmental impacts, uh, in fact, erasing some environmental impacts. Uh, so this is really interesting. So um, we have a, a question in the uh, chat. Uh, so what is, well, the first question is, what is the range of the co-flow jet? That's kind of a, a big question, I think. Uh, do you under, I, I assume he means the eVTOL aircraft. Um, yeah, the range, um, if it's um, <clears throat> the, uh, the eVTOL we design, yeah, we have, yes, here's uh, some range. <laughs> For the uh, five seaters, we get 714 kilometer, but this is based on power density of 400. Um, WHKG. So yeah, if you are using today's, let's say 300, we can get about 500 km. And for the uh, <clears throat> that's the that's a short takeoff landing. And for um, vertical takeoff landing, again, it is based on that power density. You can see that here's about 510 km. Um, and and the reason the range is shorter is because. Anytime an aircraft is flying vertically, it's using up a lot of its power. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, this tool shows a very good um, difference. If you do shot using runway, actually here we, are, we take the example of the runway is 30 meter. That's about 30 yards, right? So all, about 100 foot. So we can save a lot of power. But if you vertically take off, think about the power you need would have to be lifted up the whole weight and you have you consume more power, therefore you sacrifice your range. And I put the power there. The maximum power for short takeoff landing is 360 horsepower for this aircraft. But if you want the vertical takeoff landing, it's 1146 horsepower. So if you were a oh I don't know, say a vertiport planner, this really highlights the the need for the benefit of some of these short takeoff and landing strips as compared to a vertical landing pad. Um, so we should keep that in mind when we're planning these new vertiports of the future. Yeah, uh, there's another big building rooftop, you know, let it doesn't try to use it as a little runway. <laughs> right, right. Uh, just a bridge between two tall buildings, something like that. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. That's not what I'm proposing at all. So we have another question. Um, how have you funded your work so far to date? Um, we mostly funded it by government, for example, DARPA, NASA, Air Force, and we received $2.5 million. And then from uh, you know, friends or family, we get about $0.6 million. And we're currently actually working with a Pan American Finance, their investment bank in the 
in Miami uh, trying to do the seed fund, uh, seed round fundraising for $4 million. Um, yeah, that is our current <laughs> funding status. Uh, I have a question that says, what wind speed is required to operate a co-flow jet wind turbine efficiently? Is it efficient at low wind speeds, high wind speeds, both? It is actually efficient for across the, all the wind speed, in particular the low wind speed, because conventional turbine cannot generate much power, but we can. We can go, we can reduce the lower limit of the wind speed at least by 20%. The reason when we have a low wind speed, we can go higher, uh, lower pitch angle or call higher angle of attack without being stored, but conventional air turbine would be stored. So our lift coefficient will be much higher and the power efficiency will be much higher. And that's why we can increase the capacity factor at least by 20%. Capacity factor is annual average of the uh, power output. And most of the time, the wind turbine will work at the low wind speed. Even though every turbine has a rated speed, for example, the turbine may be rated speed is 11 meter per second but you don't have a lot of time working there. A lot of time you will work like maybe five meters per second, seven meters per second is just below your rated power. So it's very important to increase low wing speed power, but we are able to increase all. <clears throat> Please tell me that we have, or you have got patents for this technology and we're not just giving this information away to the world for free. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we patent. We already have 17 patents issued and we have more patents pending. So we are quite well protected. That's great. <laughs> um, can I retrofit an existing aircraft wing? Could I go to Cessna and say I want a 172 with a co-flow jet wing and, and, and improve the performance of my small aircraft? Yes, you can. Um, <clears throat> But you probably, the best way is to design from scratch so that the control surface, everything can be well optimized. But if you just retrofit wing, um, you probably also need to uh, changing, redesign a little bit of control surface. Yes, this is we an example. We use a tandem wing to balance the, uh, the increased pitching moment because of the high lift. Also, as you've told me before, you're taking the wingtip vertice off the front canard, which is shorter than the main wing, and you're using that lift that comes off of that uh, that canard, much like two geese flying south for the winter. Uh, the second goose uses the lift created from the from the bird in front of it. Is that correct? Yes, somehow yes. Actually, uh, one of our chief engineer, uh, our chief Dr. Ren, he studied. Uh, vortex capturing uh, mechanism using tandem wing from using co-flow jet, we are able to increase the aerodynamic efficiency substantially by capturing the tip vortex. Tip vortex is something people in general dislike, but if you make a good use of it, there's a lot of energy. When the vortex is spinning, it means kinetic energy. How can you make good use of this energy? And using co-flow jet, we are able to make good use and that's that's the same thing that birds are using when you see them fly in a v formation right yes very similar yes do you know why there's uh, whenever you see that and you see birds flying in a v do you know why one side is longer than the other side um it's be it's because there's more geese on that side that's all <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> that's you. my favorite stupid dad joke so um <laughs> <laughs> what specific, here's another question from the audience. What specific applications are you looking at for the EV toll passenger, cargo, et cetera? Cargo, which, do you, are they all the same to you? Um, we have the same technology, but our first product would be cargo uh, because we feel there's um, more demand, higher demand for uh, e-commerce. And then when we have the deliver the first product of the cargo and we will do the um, urban transportation. Because when you can build a larger uh, EV toll, it's probably a little bit uh, the experience we learn can be used for a smaller one. And the uh, and the larger cargo we are talking about is about 
15 tons payload for 300 miles using fully electric um, electric power. We talked on one of these slides briefly about uh, these aircraft have lower noise. Can you tell me why that is? Um, at we are lower in general at the cruise, the noise would be a lot determined by the disc loading of the propeller and of course your overall design and whatever experience, let's say Joby already created and we can use the similar concept. There's one advantage other aircraft does not have is that we we feel the wake. We basically don't have the wake. And that is like an owl when they catch a mice, very, very quiet. So that is a cruise efficiency uh, noise is not too difficult today with a distributed propeller, but it is the hover. The advantage, as I mentioned, is that we avoid the downwash um, interaction with wing and aircraft. And hover is more crucial stage for noise because when you do hover, you are in the neighborhood. You have to be very quiet or silent. That's our goal. Um, the advantage, the reason is that we can feel the wake. We don't have the uh, the interaction of the downwash in the wing. Again, I, I feel like you have changed physics in the world with this technology. I'm blown away by it every time we talk about it. <laughs> you, you have uh, made wings more efficient, wind turbines, ships, you've cut back on the fuel that they're gonna use. Uh, it's all very exciting. Is there anything else you want to talk about anything before we wrap up today? Um, well, you know, as I mentioned that it's a fundamental technology, so the impact uh, can be very high. Um, but it is a, the so-called deep technology. We need a good investment and um, a little time to develop it. So we are just hoping people with uh, <laughs> interest Hope the same common interest is trying to impact the industry, make the world better, join us to develop this. I have one last question that just came in regarding the ship propulsion application. Have you given much thought to the cost benefit relationship of space lost versus the benefit? Yes, we did. Actually, most of the, uh, we, we are not gonna lose much space. Um, the <clears throat> the wind cells is already used today for the larger cargo ships depends on the type of uh, cargo ships. For example, if it's tanker, you have a lot of space on outside. And the most challenging one would be container. Um, you may not have uh, enough uh, easy space for the rigid uh, cylinders, but we have designed a frame to put on, the, um, on top of the frame. So at the loading and unloading, this cylinder is not gonna be there. It's just when it's finished loading, we will put back the cylinders. That's great. So there should be very little um, room or no room to, to, to lose for, for cargo payload. That's great. So I've put this fine, the, the first slide back up again. If people want to contact you, you've got your, your email address there and your website. So if people have more questions or if they want to help uh, collaborate with you or invest, uh, they can contact you directly. Uh, again, my name's Ken Reed. I'm with Skyway Technologies. Uh, I can tell just from this conversation today that you have changed my job in how, how the infrastructure planning that we're going to be doing for EV toll aircraft is going to have to change and adapt to these new technologies and how we can save fuel and, and make air, the whole system more efficient uh, just by recognizing some of these things. I appreciate everybody's time for coming today. And uh, again, reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, but that wraps it up. Uh, I appreciate your time, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Ken, thank you for a great <laughs> hosting the program. Well, we will do it again because I, I find it fascinating. <laughs> thank you, everybody, and have a great day.